everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we are gonna dip dye to break food coloring twice. Uh, we are going to dip dye into one mixture that will break, and then dip dye the yarn into a second mixture that will break, and see how these colors layer together, and I think it'll be really, really fun. Now, before I explain more about what color breaking is and the project, uh, what do you need to dye yarn with food coloring? And yes, you can dye yarn with food coloring as long as you pick the right yarn. Food coloring is a type of acid dye. And so if you have heat, acid, and a protein-based yarn, you can dye really, really beautiful colors. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're using a wool-based yarn or alpaca silk, other types of protein fibers. This technique will not work on cotton, other plant-based fibers, or acrylic and polyester synthetics, but it does work on blends, so that's worth keeping in mind. What is color breaking? Breaking is when you have one color mixture, say a purple, but then when you're dyeing with it, you see it sort of separate into different hues. And with dip dyeing into a purple mixture, we can really see this to an extreme, where we'll see pinks, purples, and blues all from that one mixture. And this is one of my favorite techniques and even the colors that are in my logo are based on Wilton's Violet Food Coloring Breaking. In the US, there are five main artificial food coloring molecules that you can find uh, across lines. There are a couple others that are technically available, but I don't really come into contact with them as much. Um, of them, the one that strikes the fastest is red number three. If you have a food coloring and there's red three in it, it'll probably break. It needs very, very little acid and it's gonna strike and hit the yarn. Uh, red 40 also strikes really, really fast, a little bit slower than red three. Um, and then after that come the yellows. Yellow five and yellow six are yellow orange hues. Uh, those go somewhere in the middle. And then finally, the slowest is blue number one, which needs more acid and time to bind. And so if you have a mixture with red three and blue one, it and other colors in there, it will probably break. I have done a lot of this with randomly combining different colors of food coloring and then seeing how they break. And we've had some really, really fun results. There've been a lot of this like fun, random mystery live streams that I've done in the past. And man, I really am hoping to do one again. But today what we're doing is different. Rather than mixing two mixtures together to see how they break, we're gonna take two different colors that I know break, and then dip dye into one, and then dip dye into another, which is just a different way to layer these colors together. And I think it should be a lot of fun. Instead of going with my favorite Wilton's Violet, sorry friend, I think today we are gonna go for teal and copper. I mixed these two together from one of my random draws many years ago, and the combination was really, really beautiful. Uh, and so I thought that it would be really, really fun to play with. Teal is made up of blue one and yellow five. And it does break, um, although very, very subtly. And I think it really works because there is a lot more blue than the yellow. And so if you're dipping slowly, you can get those yellows to bind before all of the blues and therefore see that, that really pretty teal green to a blue type gradient. Now with copper, I don't really remember <laughs> how it did on its own. It's got a lot in it. There's yellow five, red 40, yellow six, and red three, and even a tiny bit of blue one. It definitely does break, but again, I don't remember how it does on its own. But I wanted to pick two colors for this that broke that aren't the exact same profile. Uh, and that's, you know, if I picked, say, like, violet and teal, like, it, it wouldn't be as, like, extreme or different. When breaking colors, what you're trying to do is, it's like yarn, it's, it's yarn chromatography. You're trying to separate the different molecules uh, based on the different situations. And so by, uh, you can sort of make it a little more extreme with the amount of 
acid and time and heat that you have in there. And so it is really, really fun. But sometimes it can be harder to capture that breaking if everything starts striking to the yarn too fast. So typically we start with a lower acid and then increase the acid as needed. And this is another reason why dip dyeing can be really helpful to exaggerate breaking because since only a portion of the yarn is in contact with the dye at a time that allows you to soak up, for example, those reds really quickly before moving on to some of the other hues. I already mentioned acid, but the yarn can make a big difference with this as well. Uh, right here I have pre-soaked 200 grams of Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Worsted Weight Yarn. This yarn is 100% Peruvian Highland wool and it's non-superwash. In general, superwash yarn uh, absorbs dye faster than non-superwash, which can make it a little harder to get the breaking. And I should also add that my tap water is slightly acidic, which means that some colors like red three will start to strike with little to no acid at all. So if your tap water is alkaline, you might need to add more acid than I do to get things to strike. So it's worth keeping that in mind. We are gonna dye 200 grams of yarn today. Uh, and a ratio that I really, really like with food coloring is one half teaspoon of food coloring per 100 grams of yarn. And so therefore, that's what we're gonna do for each color. And hopefully there is enough. Yeah, there's enough of the teal, it's sort of all approximate. I am going to be dissolving the colors in uh, half a cup of warm tap water. And food coloring does stain, <laughs> uh, so if you would like to avoid that, then I recommend wearing gloves. Okay, it's all approximate. Yeah. It's approximately half a teaspoon. Now this icing color is really thick. Like if I turn it upside down, it's not really going anywhere. And this is why I like using warm tap water. Um, it really helps uh, for the colors to dissolve. In general, when it comes to food coloring, I really like using liquid drops. I think my favorite food coloring right now is the Wilton Colorite food coloring system because it has each of those colors that I mentioned as uh, primaries, each of those five main food coloring molecules. And so then you can really mix a lot of colors that you want. But I wanted to start with pre-mixed colors today. And so, uh, yeah, I think that it'll be fun. But the uh, warm water, it helps, oops, it helps then get the, the food coloring out and really, really helps dissolve it. I really, really recommend using warm tap water uh, to dissolve it. it. It goes a lot faster uh, than just using cool tap water. I am currently heating up a pot with 12 cups of water and I am gonna add one tablespoon of white vinegar. We're gonna start with pretty low acid. Although it's been a while since I've broken teal and I might want more acid, but at least we'll start and see um, if we can see the, the breaking that happens. Now, with some colors, I like to add the dye uh, as close to adding the yarn to the pot as possible, uh, especially if the dye has red three because that can start to crash out. But with teal, that doesn't make as big of a difference. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this to the pot that's warming up. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful blue-green color. And now I'll just let this heat up. I am personally comfortable using cooking pots and pans with food coloring uh, to dye yarn as long as everything that I'm using is has never been used with any commercial dyes. So if I am going to be using uh, zip ties or squeeze bottles or something else I've used with commercial dyes, then I'll use dedicated dye equipment with the food coloring. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But obviously you should check your own comfort level. But please, if, you have, if you're using commercial dyes on anything, do not reuse that equipment for the preparation of food. 
I gently squeezed out most of the water from our yarn and now we're ready to start dip dyeing. One reason why we're dyeing 200 grams of yarn today is that I want the second dip to be very, very different uh, from the first and I'm excited about that. But I really don't remember what it's gonna take to get this to break. So I'm going really, really, really slow. At this acid concentration with this yarn, the final blues should not necessarily start striking. I'm getting a spoon so I can check the color. I mean, it's looking very blue. Um, well, yellow, greens, I sort of mentioned, greens are a little bit harder than uh, some other colors just because it is ultimately really, really subtle. Um, those differences that you get. Uh, it's, it's super, super subtle. I don't think that the rate difference between yellow and blue is anywhere near as extreme as it is with red and blue, uh, at least with regards to food coloring. So if I lift this up, I'm going to see some color start to drain out. And it's hard to say because I'm not feeling a huge, huge shift on this yet. So I am going to, oh dear, make a mess. Just quickly squeeze that out, set that aside, clean up my mess. All right, and now I want to add another tablespoon of white vinegar. I feel like when I've broken this in the past, I have started with one tablespoon of vinegar in eight cups of water, but I was also only, I had more dye and less yarn. So <laughs> it might not be, I mean, I know I picked a really, really subtle one here. That color is so pretty, but I'm trying really, ah, uh, here we go really hard to be slow and now now I'm starting to see so see how green that is and when I push the yarn in now that looks more blue it is super subtle super 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 subtle <laughs> um, but it does exist and the thing that's hard is wanting to capture those blues, but also wanting to like have some of it show. So um, that's why <laughs> we're going really, really, really slow. Uh, and let's see, I'm not even sure if the difference in the color is perceptible on the end, but what I do see now is a definite gradient um, of color. Now some people might uh, worry about felting and it's definitely a concern, but we're not doing a lot of agitation in here, so I am not super, super worried. Okay, let's see. Uh, see the blues are starting to strike as well okay I'm gonna go ahead and add all the yarn in right now uh, because I do want to capture some of this more blue and I think that you can see in here that this is more green this end over here is more blue and it's really promise it is more than just a concentration difference it's because of the yellows that we have in here um, so what do I want to do I want to add more acid yet uh, oh dear yeah let's add more acid so there's definitely teal all over I'm gonna go ahead and add one two tablespoons of white vinegar over here. So 
so we can try to get that those blues to bind. The pot's a little crowded, um, and as I said, this is a subtle one right here, but it's still fun. So uh, I'm now going to let this sit for, I'm reducing the heat for 10 minutes and I'll come back. Again, it's subtle, but it's definitely more green and more blue. And this will be a fun color to layer the copper over. Oh right, but why am I doing two? Because we're gonna shift them uh, and dip them in different ways into the copper, even though at the same time, but we'll create two different colorways. At least that's the goal. It has been 10 minutes and oof, there's a lot of color on this yarn already and not a lot of color left in the pot. Most of it has absorbed. There is still some here in the pot. I just added three tablespoons of white vinegar. The second dip is gonna happen in another pot, or I mean in the same pot but with new water. Um, I am going to turn off the heat. I'm gonna leave the yarn in here for 15 minutes, then we'll remove it, let it cool, and we'll quickly rinse it just to dilute that acid in the yarn before uh, setting up for the copper. All right, let's see how much color is left now. You know, I saw the breaking in the pan and out of the pan it is looking like I picked up some more teal in there. So now I'm like having my, my doubts. There's no color left here in the pot though. It's in certain sections. I mean, the, the teal, I didn't hit like a sweet spot with the acid, so you can kind of see it. There's definitely still some teal that's in there. It wasn't quote a perfect break where we got the bright blue at the end, but I do maintain, I think that there is more yellow here than there. Uh, but the next color should also break. And so when this cools, we'll rinse it and then prepare the yarn for the next dip. Meanwhile, we're gonna reset this pot with new water uh, and acid. So I'll once again add 12 cups of water and one tablespoon of white vinegar. The yarn is cool, and so I'm just gonna quickly pop it back in to the original pre-soak. Um, this should dilute the total amount of acid that is in the yarn because there is some left in here from that pre-soak, well, not from, I guess from the dyeing process. Oof. Check out that blue and the green. Oof. It is so subtle and pretty. So I'm just gently tapping it. It's still gonna have some acid in here. It's just diluted now. So that could affect the way that we see the colors come in for the next stage, but and we'll see, but now let's arrange the yarn. We are going to dip dye these two skeins into the copper in two different ways. One, I'm gonna dip in the exact same way with the dark, uh, the teal going in first, with the blue going in at the end. And the other, I'm gonna reverse it. And we'll dip in with the teal first and have the, sorry, and we'll dip in with the blue first and have the teal at the end. I considered rotating one of these sort of halfway around, but since the color is so, differences are so subtle here, I thought it would be fun to have one example that is going to be a little more similar to if I had mixed all the dye together in the first place. But I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. And then one where we dip dyed one way and we dip dyed the other, and just to see what we see using two different colors that break. Teal breaking is so subtle overall that we might not see a huge difference here. So we may want to try this again, say with violet or something first. That's a little more extreme. But the result from dip dyeing twice using the same end first is not going to be identical to if we had mixed the two together and then dip dyed to break that. And that is really just based on the rates. It's possible that I might dip dye into the copper faster than I did the teal, and so therefore where the colors start to separate and break uh, will be slightly different. And the same goes for if I had two colors that didn't break. 
and I did the dip dyeing in two rounds. Because the darker to light can shift, it will have a different layered feel than if you had everything combined before dip dyeing. Unfortunately, I don't have plans to do uh, the teal and copper combined uh, separately today, but it's worth just, I guess, keeping all these in mind as we play with this. And certainly, this is not the last time we're gonna layer uh, different food coloring colors with dip dyeing. So, uh, let's go and dye in the copper. Since the copper food coloring has red number three in it, I like to wait until I'm absolutely ready to start dip dyeing before I add the dye. Uh, this is because that red three can crash out of solution. So I'm going to have the yarn right here ready to go and give the dye in the cup one more stir. Look at that pretty copper color. That sounded like there was a blip of dye down there. Maybe I didn't mix it well enough, but it's okay. It's okay. We will see how this all goes. And now, coming in, we're going to slowly, slowly dip. Ooh, but look at that color. That's like purple. So pretty. So pretty. Um, and again, the, the differences in the teal are super subtle, so we'll see what differences we end up seeing. That is so cool looking. Uh, there's only one, again, only one tablespoon of vinegar in here. There is definitely acid in the yarn, uh, but not that much. So we will see. Okay, so it looks like we've had a lot of the reds strike. And, oh, where's my spoon? Okay, we are still in a very, like, orangey copper color. But the color that we see on the yarn is definitely getting more yellow. It's more green than what we saw before. And I think I let the water volume here go down a little bit low, so it's a little bit hard uh, to dip dye. And I don't know if you guys can hear it on camera, but there is a car alarm going off in my neighborhood. So, apologies if that's picking up. All right, let's see. I am definitely seeing some differences in the two colors. There's still a lot of color in the pan. What I'm going to do is add, let's see if I can do this. Okay, we are going to add, without making a mess, a tablespoon of white vinegar and keep dip dyeing. So there's no question that we've got breaking going on in here. But, oh, and the fact that we still see orange doesn't mean that there's reds left. Uh, because I think it's yellow six that is one of the yellows that is orange colored. So that does, I don't think copper break, when it breaks, I think that there's like more red and then less. But this is really pretty. Um, the one with the blue at the bottom feels more rust colored. Yeah, there's not much color left. Like this feels like it's got a little bit of brown in it and the one with the blue at the other side feels more purple. Oh, that's fun. Very, very subtle difference. I feel like a lot of the color has definitely absorbed. Unlike last time, I find myself dipping this in a way to potentially preserve some of the color that we have at the tips. I don't want to completely overload that. Okay, so now I just see a hint of yellow. So let's see. 
let's see how we're gonna do this. Okay, I think I am going to add all of the yarn in now. And I'm going to leave this for five minutes. Now, the breaking that we see in here this time is much more extreme, but keep in mind that this teal and blue, which the blue is definitely gonna be a lot more teal now because of the little bit of yellow left, but the teal and blue uh, was the extremes of the first, and so now we have more like purples and greens and browns that are in there, but it's very beautiful. So I'll come back in 15 minutes. After 13 and a half minutes, uh, I just checked and the water looks clear. Although, I do see a tiny bit of transfer of color from the yarn that was below onto, onto the yarn, which is something that is not totally unusual. But, wow. And the thing that I didn't expect, and maybe it's because of the pigmentation also, but the big difference here is the colors at the bottom. The one where I dipped the blue in first has more of this brown, almost reddish hue. And the one with the blue at the top, with the teal going in first, feels more purple. That is really, really cool. Okay, I, I am going to go ahead and leave this in the pot to cool. It looks like all the color is set, but I'm just gonna leave it in here to cool completely, and then we can wash the yarn. But this is really fun. And I think really shows how subtle differences in the saturation when you go to layer colors can make a huge difference in how things come out, even though this top end looks super subtle now. I am now going to wash the yarn in some cool tap water. But I'm already really just excited. The differences here in these colors are subtle, but I guess it just shows how uh, you get more complexity when all of a sudden you are layering uh, <laughs> two different colors that break because it's more like layering three, four, five colors instead of just two. Uh, and so that is fun. I'm gonna add a tiny bit of just some clear dish soap here to the bath. Since the dye pot was completely clear, I'm not anticipating seeing any bleeding here. Uh, you do wanna be careful when washing a non-superwash yarn like this, but yeah, I'm not seeing any bleeding. So I'm gonna rinse out the soap Put the yarn through my spin dryer to remove some of the liquid and hang it up to dry so then we can come back and think about what combinations of colors we might want to play around with when it comes to dip dyeing and then the different ways we can do it. Uh, maybe we need to do copper and violet. We dip dyed 100 grams of Knit Picks Wool of the Andes, a 100% Peruvian Highland wool worsted weight yarn into two different colors of food coloring first into teal, then into copper. And both of these food coloring mix mixtures are ones that break into different hues of color. When we dip dyed these skeins into the teal, we had them lined up the same way with this end of the yarn going into the teal first, giving us this teal to blue, really, really subtle gradient with the bluer end down here. Then, we flipped one of them around to dip into the copper, and that gives these dramatic differences that we see here. Um, in this one, we dipped the opposite end into the copper first, and this one we dipped the same end into the yarn first, uh, or sorry, into the dye first at the same time. And the big differences that we have are the hues of the yarn down here at the end. When we had the teal present, we have this very burgundy hue. Where it was more of the blue, when we added the copper color, we've got a lot of rust. There's some hints of brown going up into the green, but it's sort of a rusty red. It a, feels a brighter red. And we did dip these two into the copper at the same time. And I think that because 
we had more blue and yellow present in this one. That's why it feels more purple and maybe why it feels a brighter red over here. And these results are so subtly different, but also so dramatically different. I do think that our blue here did shift more teal, especially once we had some of the end of our copper go onto it, which is why the difference here isn't as dramatic in terms of hue. It is more of saturation, but I think that these are just gorgeous. I could have picked two colors that would have given more of a dramatic result, but I think that I went, I wanted to go with two colors that felt very different. Because if I picked, say, Wilton's Violet and then Black, um, both which sort of have related feels into the way they break, uh, it might not feel that different to just dip dyeing into Wilton's Violet twice, which it would have been felt different. And that's something that I am happy to explore in the future. I just wanted to do something a little less expected, if that makes sense. This is really an example of how layering different colors together can give you really different results. It ultimately depends on the proportions. And wow, I, and these results are absolutely different than if I were to have mixed the teal and the copper together one-to-one -one and done one single dip dyeing, which I didn't do for this video, um, but I have done in the past. And I feel like you know, I don't remember if the end color, it was certainly one of those and it went into like more through the green to like a little bit of a blue, but the blue at the end wasn't as turquoise. I feel like maybe it was a bit paler if I have to remember off the top of my head, but it's still a beautiful, beautiful colorway. I think the odds of getting something more dramatic are potentially greater for acid dyes that break um, in a more extreme way than doing this with food coloring, just because there are more pigment molecules around that are used with uh, in commercial dyes, whereas when we're dealing with food coloring, all of these premixed colors are some combination of five main ingredients uh, that all behave slightly differently when it comes to yarn. So. Uh, it's just worth keeping that in mind. Once again, to dye yarn with food coloring, you need four main components. Protein-based yarn, like the wool we use today, the artificial food coloring, acid, which we use vinegar, and then heat, which we had from our stovetop uh, to dip dye the yarn. And then the way that you can combine those together is, gosh, limitless. There are so many colors and so many techniques that you can explore with food coloring. And it's a really great way to sort of dip your toes into the yarn dyeing world and see if it's something that you like before investing in dedicated dye equipment, uh, respirator masks, and other things that you need to dye yarn with commercial acid dyes. Now through this Dye Pot Weekly series, I started having only really dyed with food coloring and some tie-dye. I had done some tie-dye, but that's basically where my experience lied. And then through the series, you can watch me to explore with non-food safe dyes like RIT and move on into commercial acid dyes. And it has really been a journey. I do have a blog post of my favorite tools and equipment for dyeing yarn. If you are interested in sort of starting, getting started to assemble dedicated dye equipment, for your dyeing process. Uh, and so I will, I always have a link to that down in the video description, along with um, yarn bases and other things that I use in my videos. So that's always a handy resource if you want to try to replicate my results. When you can get such beautiful colors with food coloring, why would you ever want to move to commercial dyes? And the main reason is that you have access to more colors that don't break. Now, I happen to love colors that break. As you can see, there's a lot of them here on my channel. But sometimes you want to be able to play with an actual black or gray that doesn't split apart. And that is something that you can find in commercial acid dyes that you can't find uh, with food coloring. But 
I will say that my kids and I all wear hats that I dyed with food coloring many years ago. So uh, as a family and as a dyer, certainly food coloring is a source that I will continue playing with for a long, long, long time, even though I absolutely love playing with commercial acid dyes now. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and if you enjoyed this video, subscribe, turn on notifications, you know, that bell, ring it, and you can even turn them to always on so you get notifications whenever I release a new video or start a live stream. That way you never miss the fun. I post at least two videos a week and sometimes even more. And we just have a lot of different ways to play with color, to explore, and there's even more fun stuff coming up. If you love the yarn that I dye and would like to bring some home, go and check out the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. The shop is filled with dozens and dozens of skeins of hand dyed yarn. And I always include in the item description the type of dye that I used, whether it's commercial acid dyes, fiber reactive dyes, food coloring. And I also include the video title and the approximate date the video was published. So that way you can go watch the dyeing process. So checking out the shop is also a really great way to get some sneak peeks of some stuff that's coming up because sometimes, not always, but sometimes yarn ends up in the shop before the videos have been released. Uh, so I guess also spoiler warning, but it's a fun way to get a little bit excited about what might be coming up. Thank you so much for watching everyone.